I'll let you in on a secret. The financial services industry, they don't want you to know how to invest. Why would they? They make far too much money the way things are. Banks announcing another great big profit. Bank profits are near record levels. And banks are making lots more profits. Which the numbers are certainly staggering. Trillions of dollars. And then there's you. As a beginner, you can often sit there and think, I'll never get this. I don't understand the options. The information online is just confusing. What the f is a fractional share? I get it, it's confusing, and it's probably intentional. Give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, and he'll stop buying them from you. In a simple analogy, imagine I take you to China now and I say you need to cook me a meal. You could be the best chef in the world, but without an understanding of the Chinese language, you're going to struggle. How do you find a supermarket? How do you get there? How do you understand anything that's on the shelf? What you'll likely end up with is a load of ingredients which make a meal of some sort, but not really reflective of what you wanted, and are certainly not reflective of your skills and intelligence. So instead of chancing it, you look for help. Someone to show you the way. And there I am, stood right next to you. Don't worry, I'll help you out. I'll show you what it all means. And all you gotta do is paint me. So let me get this straight. You created the problem by making everything so confusing. Mm-hmm. And now you want me to pay you for the solution. Yep. Sound far-fetched? This is the deal you're presented with by the financial services industry. Want proof? Equities, derivatives, fixed income, OEIC, unit trust, volatility, bare bull, call put, and even a dead cat bounce. All examples of the financial foreign language designed to stop you from making the investment meal you're capable of. So that's where I come in. In this series of videos, we're gonna look at the basics of investing and not just high level mindset stuff, we're really gonna get into the mechanics of it here. We'll break down the terminology and jargon and together build an understanding of investing that allows you to go away and pick your own investments, but not just by regurgitating what I tell you. Let me show you how to break this down so you can become fluent in the language. So you know what the options are, why you're buying them and what they can do for you. So this is episode one of that series, and really there's only one place we can start. If this was the Chinese supermarket situation, then understanding asset classes is like me showing you how to get to the supermarket and telling you what's on the shelf. When you first start investing, it feels like there's infinite options. So many items on the shelf, how could you possibly pick the best thing? It's only once you understand that while there are a few options, they can all be grouped into categories. And once you understand these categories, things become a lot clearer. It's kind of like food groups. Pasta, rice, bread, potatoes. All very different, but we know they're all carbohydrates. Understanding the asset classification, what their properties are, and what the key investment principles are of assets of that type, will shine a light on what you're buying and what that actually means. So what I'm saying is all these options, all these potential investments that you could buy can be grouped into five broad categories based on what they are and how they act. And by understanding these categories, you can translate any investment language into the core characteristics of that asset class. So you know what you're buying and why. First, let's quickly define what an asset is so we can understand what an asset class is. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as an item of property owned by a person or company regarded as having value and available to meet debts, commitments or legacies. Let's simplify that to something that is owned that can be exchanged for cash or used to pay off debts. An asset class is a grouping of assets that exhibit similar characteristics and are subject to the same laws and regulations, according to Investopedia.com. I would simplify that by saying an asset class is a grouping of different things of value that act in similar ways. I would say there are five broad asset classes, cash, equities, fixed income, real estate, and commodities. Pretty much any investment you can make can fit into one of those pots. So let's take a look at the types of investment in each pot, the characteristics of those investments, and I'll point you in the direction of a few places that you can buy each of them if you want to. First up, cash. The purest of assets and the most liquid, meaning you can convert it into cash easily. Of course cash is easy to convert into cash, it's cash. But how you look after your cash can vary. You can have physical cash in your wallet or stashed under your bed, or you could have it stored in traditional bank accounts or more modern online platforms. If it was me, I would limit the amount of cash I hold to only what I need day to day. Otherwise, inflation is going to get you. Inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman. Ronald Reagan. We won't get too deep into inflation here, but all you need to know is the government wants an inflation rate of around 2%. That means they want the cost of things that you buy today to go up by around 2% by next year. Meaning if you don't make your cash grow, it's essentially losing value. This is why a Mars bar used to cost 27p. If I was looking to protect the value of cash that I wanted easy access to for something like an emergency budget, so it wasn't a large amount of cash, I would put it into a high interest savings account. Money saving expert always have a good breakdown here of the options. And you could put it into an ISA structure for a large amount of cash where you were worried about being taxed on interest. 
Saving for your first home is likely the main reason most people will build up a large part of cash. Go check out our Lifetime ISA. They're a great place for saving for your first home due to the 25% top up. My aim with any of the cash that's in my life is to earn enough interest to prevent the eroding effects of inflation decreasing the value over time. It is wise to build up a pot of cash before you start any other types of investment so that you can weather any storms, pay for any emergencies, etc. But I don't hold cash as a long-term investment. I do that with equities. Translation, owning a piece of a business. To start up funding IPO, shares, fractional shares, index funds and ETFs, all just posh ways of saying owning pieces of businesses. Start up funding and IPOs are not really something us novice investors can get a slice of. You could use a site like Crowdcube to provide startup funding for businesses, where you exchange cash for a slice of the business, in the hope that one day they grow to a point where they either list on the stock market or sell to a competitor. You do get shares in the business, but ultimately this is high risk, as you're gonna to have to wait potentially a long time before you can get your funds back out. I personally focus my attention on shares, ETFs and index funds, which again are just posh ways of saying owning pieces of businesses. A share is one piece. You buy it off someone at a price that fluctuates day to day based on lots of different factors. If I'm buying shares in individual companies, I do this on platforms like Free Trade and Trading212. I do this because they're free to trade on, whereas other platforms can charge you up to 11 pounds per trade, which when you're first starting is really expensive. But when building my investment meal, it's wise to pick a few shares off the shelf. You don't want to risk just buying one ingredient, taking it home, and then that goes bad and your meal's ruined. And picking lots of individual shares requires some level of competence. You need to be able to assess whether that business is a good purchase or not. You need to be able to know how to value a business, which is a lesson for another day. So if you're the type who wants an investment you can just grab off the shelf and everything is prepared for you, well, ETFs and index funds are like the ready meals of the investment world. Rather than picking all the equity ingredients yourself, index funds are collections of equity investments, so a collection of companies you can buy parts of, arranged in one easy to consume format. An example of such an index would be the FTSE All World Index, which is available for you to pick up off the shelf and purchase wherever you like, and contains a massive 3,100 different companies. You add your money to the fund whenever you like, it's as easy as buying it on a debit card, and that money is then spread across 3,100 businesses automatically for you. It's the investing equivalent of an all-in-one Chinese banquet for two that you can pick up at a supermarket. The key difference between an index fund and an ETF is how you buy and sell them and the fees involved. A fund is valued once per day, so if someone calculates the value of all the companies in that fund and then sets a fixed price. If you buy on that day, you buy the fund at that fixed price. Now, while an ETF is a fund, exchange traded fund, like an equities ready meal, it's bought and sold like a single share. Its price moves up and down throughout the day and whenever you buy it, you buy it as if it was a share. But you still get the benefits of the index fund. When I'm investing in index funds, I use Vanguard. If I was buying an ETF, I would use Free Trade or Trading 212 again as ultimately I don't want to pay trading fees. But remember, even though ETFs are funds and have all the same benefits of an index fund, they're bought and sold like shares, so they will incur a dealing fee if you don't use a free broker. So again, trading 212 or free trade here in the UK, or if you're watching this in America, you could use a platform like Robinhood. And for the record, a fractional share is just a part of a share. So for example, Google share price is around $1,500 at the minute. So to buy just one share is quite a chunk of change. A fractional share will allow you to buy a part of a share. So you can invest $20 in Google and you buy a fraction of one of those shares. A fractional share. Should have just called it a bit of a share. Of all the asset classes we discussed today, equities are seen as the most risky, especially in the short term. Bad things can happen. Just look at Boohoo and the nosedive that they've taken recently on the bad news that some of their suppliers were engaging in shady practices, i.e. sweatshops in Leicester. For this reason and for that short-term volatility, if I'm buying equities, if I'm buying pieces of businesses, I'm doing it for the long run. If I wanted something a little bit more predictable, then I would invest in fixed income. Translation, lending money to someone. There's lots of different ways to lend money to people and the risk here is simple. If that person or company don't pay you back, you lose the money. The upside though is interest on the amount that you lend to them and the whole amount back by the end. The most common fixed income investment that you have available to you as a new investor are bonds. Bonds, another confusing way for the finance industry to say loan. But this one makes sense a bit. My word is my bond, as in I will do what I say, don't worry, I'll pay you back. Bonds come in two forms, corporate bonds, which are lent to businesses, and government bonds, which is money lent to governments. Traditionally, government bonds are seen as more secure than corporate bonds because governments are less likely to go under, 
but ultimately bonds on the whole are seen as a relatively secure investment. As people get older and approach retirement, they like to add more bonds to their investment recipe in order to reduce the risk and the ups and downs of the stock market. It's far easier to predict what you can expect from an investment that says, lend me this and I will give you back this, versus an equity investment that says, buy me at this price today and let's hope I grow in the future. This is why this asset class is called fixed income, because you know exactly what you will get back over the term of the investment as long as everything goes to plan. You also get high interest savings accounts that lock your money away for a set amount of time, or a lot of the post office investment products or the bond offerings from NS&I, National Savings and Investments, are a few examples of fixed income and where you can go to get them. But just like my equities, if I'm buying bonds or considering lending to someone as part of an investment strategy, I am both greedy and cautious. I want lots of choice without the fear of picking the wrong thing off the shelf. And it just so happens that like the equity ready meals, index funds and ETFs, there are also bond funds or loan ready meals. On Vanguard, which is the platform I use, you will literally find them listed under fixed income funds, but you're essentially just looking for anything with bond in the title and then you know, okay, this means I'm lending money to someone if I buy this. Who is that someone? Well, just have a look at the name, government, corporate, and a Google of the fund name will give you a load of insight. So already now in a few minutes, the language is starting to decode. You know you can buy equity, so you can buy a piece of a business. You can either do that on the individual level, just buying one type of business, or you can buy a pre-prepared kit that includes lots. You know that equities are often seen as more risky, especially in the short term. So you could always water down that risk with a bit of fixed income, which is just lending money to someone. But all these investments seem a bit non-tangible, just money exchange and hands and numbers on the screen. What if you want something that you can touch, something that you can feel? Hello, real estate. Translation, owning a physical space. Call it property, but it's essentially anything you can rent out. You make money on the rent, and hopefully the value increases over time. There's actually a few surprising ways you can own property that don't require loads of cash. But the first is the traditional way. Saving up a deposit and buying with a mortgage, then renting it out. It can be a lot of hassle, but you do benefit from that sweet, sweet leverage. You know when you're opening a tin of paint, doing it with your fingernails hurts. But get a screwdriver and just with a little click, that's leverage. And it works the same with money. The fact that you own the home or the office block, but you don't have to stump up all of the cash because you can use a mortgage, emphasizes any gains that you make from that property. And just like the screwdriver emphasizes the force of your hand, if you buy a house for 100 grand and you only put 25,000 pounds into it, meaning that you've contributed 25%, if that house goes up in value by 25%, so the price increases from 100,000 to 125,000, you've doubled your money. As you put in 25,000 and the value of the house has now increased by 25,000, meaning that you've got a total of 50,000 pounds in equity. Leverage, I'm not an estate agent, and I assume most people know the process for finding a home they want to buy if that's the route you want to take. If you want to check out commercial property, look for an agent that specializes in it. For example, Christie & Co. I'm not recommending these, I just used to work there when I first graduated from university. Another example would be Cushman and Wakefield. They're a competitor, they do the same thing. The leverage aspect of real estate is one of the main pools. But in order to access leverage, you need to be able to borrow. If borrowing's not your thing, then there's always REITs, real estate investment trusts. You don't get the benefit of leverage, which I just discussed, but these are a fantastic way to buy property. Hear me out. Like a fund in equities, REITs collect everyone's money and buy property with it. So even if you only invest £100, you will have exposure to a property. And different REITs invest in different types of property. It isn't all office blocks and houses, although there are REITs that do that. With REITs, you could always do something a bit different. I like this Trick Tracks Big Box REIT. Big Box refers to the fact it builds and owns those large grey warehouses you see on the motorway. The massive ones that all of the online businesses like Amazon store their goods in. You can get creative here. REITs give you access to all manner of different property types. A lot of them would normally be out of your affordability range. But the fact that you could throw in say 50 to 100 pound a month and own a chunk of an Amazon warehouse is pretty amazing. REITs also have to pay out a massive 90% of their profits as dividends, which means you're likely to get a healthy dividend yield. Or if you don't want to go through the hassle of researching all the different types of REITs and which type of property you want to invest in, you could opt for something like the Vanguard Real Estate Index Fund which like the index funds in equities is a collection of different REITs, a REIT ready meal. So you could buy a house to rent it out, an office space or a shop on the high street, a piece of land to develop upwards, or even a graveyard plot to dig downward. One single expensive car parking spot in a multi-story development in Dubai, or you could just pick up a REIT that gives you exposure to thousands of buildings without the massive upfront costs. It's all just real estate. And what we love about real estate is it's tangible, it lasts, it tends to stick around. But what if I told you there was an asset class where the value is based on the fact that we destroy the product, on the fact that we use it up, on the fact that it won't last forever? 
this is commodities. Translation, the raw materials that fuel the world we live in. Oil, copper, wheat, rice, gold, and even cattle. Now gold is a funny one, so we'll come back to this in a minute. But there are two main types of commodities, hard and soft. Hard commodities are materials that require mining or drilling, such as oil or coal. And soft describes commodities that will grow, like wheat, corn, and cows. The value of a commodity is linked to the price of a predetermined amount of that item. So for example, oil by the barrel, or wheat by the bushel. That price is then linked to supply and demand. For example, if there was a big harvest one year, the price of wheat would drop because of spare. Or if we were to have a global pandemic that meant no one would drive their cars anymore, demand for petrol reduces and so does the price of oil. Now there's a few ways you can buy commodities. First one, you could buy them directly. Literally, you could buy a cow or maybe a barrel of oil and hope the prices increase. But this isn't really practical because then you've got issues with upkeep and storage. Number two, you could bet on its future using future contracts. With a futures contract, you're agreeing to buy the commodity at a fixed price in the future. So you're essentially betting on the future price of that commodity, hoping it'll be worth more or less than what you agree to pay for it based on the bet you make. So like me saying, I'll sell you flour for one pound today. You say, oh, how about I come back next week and buy it for a pound instead? The next week you come back and I say to you, well, now the flour is one pound 50 because I'm the only person in town with flour left. You wave your contract in my face, hand me a pound and you've made 50p on that deal. But if you came back the next week and flour had dropped in price to 75p, you're obliged to pay a pound and in so you lose 25p as a result. Futures are complicated and risky. Only bet on the future price of a commodity if you think you know what you're doing. Personally, I would not feel comfortable putting money on predicting the price of corn in the next weeks, months, or years. But if that does sound like a bit of you, check out a platform called Plus500. They have a futures market. Number three, you could buy funds and exchange traded funds that specialize in commodities. This, in my opinion, is a better way to get a bit of skin in the game if you're new to investing via a vehicle called an ETC. Do you remember ETFs from equities? Well, the F in ETF stands for fund. The C in ETC stands for commodity. Exchange traded fund, exchange traded commodity. It tracks the price of a particular commodity. So for example, the Wisdom Tree WTI crude oil ETC, an exchange traded commodity that if you buy it, tracks the price of oil. But just like an ETF, if you start investing using ETCs, you need to watch out for dealing fees. So use platforms like Free Trade or Trading212 that don't incur dealing fees or invest a large enough amount that the fee becomes a small percentage of the overall total part that you invest. The final way to invest in commodities is option four, and that's by buying companies that specialize in those commodities. So if you want exposure to commodities, don't want to deal with dealing fees, but don't like the idea of an ETC, you could buy a company that specializes in a particular commodity. An example of that would be BP and oil. But there's one key point to understand here. While BP share price is linked to oil price, so if the oil price goes up, BP share price is likely to go up. BP share price is also dictated by internal company performance. Oil prices could go up, but BP shares could go down because it's perceived that they're run badly. BP had an oil spill. It doesn't matter what the cost per barrel price is anymore. BP share price will fall regardless. For that reason, buying commodities in this manner really makes it an equity play and not a true commodity play. Personally, I don't get too heavily involved in commodities. I don't understand them well enough and I like my investments to pay income, either in the form of rent with real estate, dividends with equities or interest in fixed income. I don't get excited by trying to predict the price of corn. But the attraction to commodities is they're a great way to diversify your portfolio and add a bit of variety to your investment plate. They typically balance shares well also as commodity prices typically move the opposite way to equities. Think of it this way, if the prices of raw materials fall, then businesses can buy those materials for cheaper, thus making more profit, meaning their share price goes up. If the price of raw materials increases, it now costs businesses more to make the same goods, meaning they make less profit and their share prices fall. Just like every good set of rules, there's always some exceptions, and I wouldn't be doing you a justice if we didn't touch on these, as they're very accessible types of investment to beginners. Gold, cryptocurrency, and peer-to-peer -peer lending are three other investment vehicles that you could choose, but it's hard to classify them within specific asset classes. Let's have a look why. Bitcoin, for example, is a currency, and you can use it to buy things, so it's kind of like cash, but its massive price fluctuations make it more of a gamble. You could literally lose 20% of the value of your currency in the time it takes you to enter the details to pay for an item. For something to be a currency like cash, it needs to be relatively stable, otherwise no one's ever going to accept it. Why would you accept payment in the form of a currency that you felt could fluctuate in price by 20% either way at a minute's notice? For that reason, you could argue that cryptocurrency is more of a wild equity play. Gold is useful. We actually put it in stuff. And not just jewelry, but electronics, computers. It's used for its conductive properties. 
So that makes it a commodity. But really the value in gold comes from the fact that people feel that it has a value. People buy gold because people buy gold. It doesn't produce an income like an equity, but we do hope that it goes up in value. Really, gold is what's known as a store of wealth. People put their money in it because the belief that over time, because it's a scarce resource, it will increase in value. But that's not a currency, that's not an equity. All you own when you buy gold, really, is a shiny rock. Peer-to-peer -peer lending, as it suggests, is lending. So you could argue that it's fixed income, as you know what you're going to get back and when, if it all goes to plan. The problem here is that a lot of the time it doesn't go to plan. Defaults in this type of investment are high, but there's ultimately a reason that these individuals are using peer-to-peer -peer lending to borrow instead of banks, and it's often because the banks won't lend to them. Just be careful here and don't get tempted by high interest rates. This isn't fixed income because it's far too risky in my opinion. Start with more established providers like Zupa who I believe have a really good track record for payments. And if this is what you want to do, put it inside an innovative finance ISO so that you don't get taxed on any of the gains. The main thing to do here guys before you make any investment is to sit back and think what asset class does this investment fit into that I'm about to buy? And are the characteristics of that asset class what I'm looking for from an investment? Don't be holding cash for retirement or buying equities with money that you need next week. The ingredients are simple, you just need to use what you've learned about asset classes today in order to know when to use them. So now we're in China and I turn to you and say what's for dinner? Tonight's menu will be focused on equities, mainly using ETFs for simplicity and variety. We'll balance out their risky flavour with a healthy dollop of fixed income, accompanied by a slice of real estate in the form of a REIT. I like my property unleveraged a side order of seasonal commodities, and of course, a large glass of liquid cash in case we get thirsty at any point. Episode two of this series will be released in the next couple of weeks, and I'll make them all into a playlist eventually when they're all done. If you made it this far, you should probably subscribe, otherwise the next time I see you, it's gonna be a little bit awkward.